This segment of the CU Podcast is sponsored by NordVPN. It's what I use to keep myself safe online, and you can too if you care about the security and safety of your online presence. Take control of your online experience today with NordVPN. I've used NordVPN when traveling, accessing public Wi-Fi at airports, restaurants, the library, cafe, or just when I want internet privacy at home. And now you can step up your cybersecurity with threat protection, the latest feature from NordVPN. When you turn threat protection on, it protects you from malicious sites, downloads, trackers, and intrusive ads. Threat protection is constantly on the lookout even if you're not connected to a VPN. NordVPN has a host of other benefits. All of your internet data stays safe behind a wall of next generation encryption. They have a strict no logs policy. They don't track, collect, or share your private data. It's really none of their business. VPN servers are everywhere. You can choose from 5,400 plus servers in 59 countries. You can enjoy the internet with no limits or borders. And they welcome P2P. You can share large files with no hassle thanks to hundreds of secure P2P servers. Worldwide access allows you to enjoy instant secure access to hundreds of streaming websites worldwide. One account lets you connect up to six devices and you can secure them all in any combination. It's just a click. Using NordVPN is as simple and intuitive as making your morning coffee. Take control of your internet experience today with NordVPN. Right now, you can get a two-year plan at a huge discount, plus one additional month for free when you go to nordvpn.com slash CU podcast. It's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. That's nordvpn.com slash CU podcast, or click the link in the description below. Let's do some uh, listener voicemails. Do some voicemails. Getting a little late, but we got to get some done. We got to answer the questions the people have. Anchor.fm slash the CU podcast. That's right. Ian gave the point there. Try to keep it short and sweet, and I love you for it. Uh, first one here. This is Paul from Raleigh and C. Hi, Paul. So the two of you have just been cast in a new Bill and Tez Excellent Adventure reboot. Only instead of rock and roll, it's about the PC game Civilization Two. And the two of you are competing against each other in the finals in a two versus two match. Which historic world leader would each of you travel back in time to get as your teammate? And who do you think would win the match? Paul, I love your questions. It requires too much thinking, though, every time I hear them. I got to like, th- I gotta like role play when I listen to these questions. Okay, we're doing a competition two on two, and we both get two world leaders to compete against each other at Civ 2. Is that what he just said? I think. Okay. Anyway, my answer is Teddy Roosevelt. <clears throat> Good old, you like go, Teddy? We're going Fierce, with Ted. Big stick? Yeah. That's the first one. We're going with Bull Moose. I thought it was oh, just, just one. No, we oh. each pick one. Oh, okay. Well, I love Honest Abe. All right. Not not, not overrated at, at all out there. You know who I'm talking about. Um, a, a versus, uh, yeah, we, we, we got, uh, we got, uh, wait, wait, yeah, Teddy's on the on the Rushmore, isn't he? No, he's not. It's, it's uh, Franklin. Yeah. It's his younger cousin on there. Sorry yeah. about that, Teddy. We almost got there. You want Washington on there? Wooden teeth, Washington? No. <laughs> Dumb wooden teeth. All right. Uh, next one here. Hi, Pat. This is Garrett again from Alabama. Hey, Garrett. You've mentioned the inevitable Tommy Tallarico Amico documentary several times now. Um, as a filmmaker and as a writer, oh. Oh. are you interested oh. in doing it? Why don't you do it? Maybe it'd be bad if you did it. I don't know. I'd watch it. What do you think? Was it like half dare, half? I think it is a dare. I because I, I got others. I got to still do a, get a book finished. I have another long term project. I can't do everything. Um, also, I think the best documentary is going to need to come from someone a bit more partial, not partial, but someone who wasn't involved. Impartial. Be- impartial. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, because ideally, you would get word from. In television. Oh, yeah. You want empl- ex employees. You, you want you ex want employees. To, and you want to talk to Tommy, try to want, spin right, things. Try to get, you want to get Tommy's take on it. And sure. there's no way we would ever get that done. Uh, no, we wouldn't. Uh, we wouldn't. It would be tough. Um, obviously, I could put some phantom money in, but I mean, like, I probably would. Just, just, but yeah. All right. Next one here. Hey, Pat. Ah, hey, fuck. Ian. This is Sorry. Will out of Chattanooga. Chattanooga. Just got through watching episode 311 of the CU podcast, where y'all talk about your disdain for the show Nick Arcade. And the mention of Nick Arcade jarred up a memory of a similar show that I used to watch in the mid-90s called Masters of the Maze. It came on the Family Channel, no idea. and I remember as a kid desperately wanting to be on that show. I remember the contestants got to wear this like cybernetic armor that I thought was really, really cool. And I wanted to ask y'all, was there a 
mid 90s or early 90s kids game show that you wish you could have competed on anyway thanks for the podcast appreciate it yeah to this day i wish i could run through the funhouse funhouse to the day today <laughs> i i, oh, I absolutely the funhouse funhouse to me yeah that looked great was the pinnacle yes. of what you it, like i loved double dare loved mark summers yes, but it but the fu- the funhouse funhouse made the obstacle course look like fucking yeah. nothing no the, the, the whole thing with the obstacle course was we're gonna put some slime on a tongue or something and you just slide down it and get a flag or or, or, or go to a giant oversized waffle no the funhouse funhouse is amazing and we should research to see if, if those parts still exist. It'd be a shame. I'm fucking looking exist. it up right now. Uh, so, Masters of the Maze was hosted by Mario Lopez. Um, I did not have Family Channel, so I never heard of it. They, they dressed up. It looks like the contestant kids dressed up like in these like spacesuits. And then um, what the hell did they do? They put a they put a VR they put a camera on their helmet and they walked through something blindfolded to find. I guess a maze blindfolded. No, th- I'm sorry. This looks. This is not fun house. This is not fun house. This is this is this is bargain bin fun house. They're walking around. Oh, they're oh, I think their partner's telling them which way to go while they're walking around blindfolded. No, that's not fun house. I'm sorry. I'm glad you liked it though. All right, next one. Uh, my basement recently flooded, and while I was working on getting that all fixed up, I had a thought. Don't you think that the three point shot in the NBA is a little over centralizing in the current meta game? Uh, what do you think that the NBA should do to address that? Should they move the line back a bit, make it only worth two and a half points, get rid of the three point foul shot? I don't know. Just curious what you think about that. I don't think, think they should. The game is more popular than it's ever been. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they should do anything. I don't. I, I, I hear a lot of this. T- I, I, and no disrespect to you, how you feel on it. But I've heard a lot of talk about the three point shot ruining basketball. And I think it's no. all f- bullshit. No, it's more exciting. It's the most exciting shot. In bas- I mean, like, it's exciting. Yeah. No, Are you I, kidding me? I do not think uh, that they should yeah, change any of that. If you want to say get rid of the, the shortest three-point shots in the corner, that is a little bit easier. And, and, the, and the percentages go up sure. in, uh, into like the 40s usually on that. If you wanted to say get rid of like the end of it, but you can't do that in the space and be fucked up on the floor. You can't do that. No one ever, no one ever take a, take a two point shot from the corner ever again. Um, so you can't do anything. Like this is just this is the way it is. You got to accept it. Yep. Because you got to accept it. And you still have inside play. Joel Embiid was our MVP runner up, and he does hit threes, but he's an inside player traditionally. Giannis plays inside. Now we're on a sports podcast. The game, the game is as exciting as it ever was. Some people, it is too offensive minded for some people. They did change rules in the past year to get rid of like some of the the bullshit fouls where you jump into a guy unnaturally. They got rid of those. And I do. I, know, I, so I I'm they, happy for they, that. They yeah. evened it out more. I prefer. You, I, I, I want to see a little more defense. You can't get rid of three foul shots on a three point attempt. Otherwise, you'd always be fouling a guy taking the three for two points. Yep. So you can't do that. It's fine. It's fine. Sorry about that. It's okay. <laughs> hey Pat. Hey Ian. Um, just got a quick question. I I don't know if you guys have answered a similar question before. We have. <laughs> uh, you know, I I use video games as maybe like a stress relief or an outlet. I'm just wondering maybe what some games you guys like to play when you know maybe you're upset or or angry or something and you. You just, I don't know, you just want to play something. We do this one a lot, but it's an easy answer for me, and I don't mind saying it each time just because if it helps you, great, it helps you. Uh, when I'm feeling miserable, upset, sad, whatever, uh, I play Pokemon, or I play a first-person dungeon crawler like Etrian Odyssey, Wizardry, something like that. Uh, I, I, I play the grindiest thing that I can possibly find. Okay. I don't get upset, so I don't do it. <laughs> hey, Pat and Ian. Uh, this is 8-Bit. I'm a chiptune composer, A-P-E-B-I-T. I actually met you guys at uh, Portland Retro Gaming Expo a few times. Nice. Anyways, my question is, uh, out of all the handheld systems from days past, uh, which ones do you think hold up the best? Microvision. Like, uh, you know, some of them with the screens and whatnot are pretty terrible, uh, so they're pretty hard to go back to unless you're emulating or something like that. Um yeah. <laughs> Which ones? I mean, if you want my, my take on what like the best models of things are, I mean, I, I, I think the Game Boy and the Neo Geo Pocket Color are my two favorites. Game Boy has a lot of pick up and play stuff. Neo Geo Pocket Color specifically holds up well because the fighting games play great and it has that thumbstick. They, they, they just they play fantastically. So it holds up well over time. Um, and it's a very unique thing that even uh, even on the analog pocket will never be recreated perfectly because the analog pocket has the D-pad instead of the, the micro switch sure. joystick. Um, 
as far as my favorite models of those, like because you mentioned screens being bad, uh, it's not a backlit system, but I do think the Game Boy Pocket is a beautiful, oh, yeah. beautiful screen. Uh, uh, it's truly and monochrome instead yeah, of no green. monochrome instead of the the green. Yeah. Uh, I I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, the Game Boy Light is also really cool, but as an owner of the Pikachu one, uh, the backlight does deteriorate over time, oh. and you start to kind of see where like the cell where that light comes from. Yeah. Uh, you you can see where like it, it almost like wears out. You can see like a a, a ring behind it. Yeah the the SP uh, oh the SP one hundred one might be the too. greatest handheld ever over like to me like you got three con three platforms, great form factor on it. It's perfect size. I think that might be the all time. If you had to pick me like what's the all time best model for uh, it'd be that one. There's a reason why they go for like now they're over hundred dollars get a one hundred one backlit. Yeah yeah they're great. No one plays on an original Game Boy Advance. That's like forgotten. Like that's well, like, if people do, but they add backlight mods. Yeah. Some people like yeah, I personally sure. like the wider grip, but you know, it sucks unless yeah, you have a backlight. You can't play it on its own. Hi, Patty, and you know, this whole Del Rio Amigo uh, situation situation has caused me to quote the angry video game nut. What were they thinking? We don't know what they were thinking. We have no idea. They don't even know what they were thinking. They have that, no clue. That's probably probably the problem. From the Sega Center in Fashion Valley, I think the newest developments would be the advent of the solid state video games and solid state pinball. That's just one of the space age games of the new Sega Center in Fashion Valley. Sega Center. Sega. What? Sega. 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 We're not doing Sega. 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 This is fucking crazy. Sega. <laughs> so there was a, a, an <clears throat> unveiled news clip from like, I think it was like 80 um, or 79. It was 79 or 80, yeah. At Fashion Valley Mall had a, a, a Sega, a Sega arcade. Um, and there was a, a news, uh, you know, a little, like little three minute story on talking to people about games and operators. And it, it, came, it made the rounds. And that was Toy, by the way. Thank you, Toy, for putting it in that little Yeah, clip. that was that was very funny. Was, yeah. It was taking a lot of time. So it was a very interesting clip because there was one game in particular, a boxing game, that people said that we don't have any. Heavyweight Champ. That's it. And champ. even like even on the Lost Media Wikipedia here, it still says Heavyweight Champ is, uh, you know, they, they never showed anything of it. But they did. That was that was the cool thing about that scene is uh, no, there, there was no there's no other video footage of Heavyweight Champ by. Uh, Sega in and, action. And we don't have a ROM, obviously, and we don't know where anyone has a cabinet. So, like, so maybe it was just put in like there as a test, right? Sort of thing. So it's one of those things where, like, that's that was like people got excited because they saw that. Yeah, it looked kind of funny too. Because I'm guessing if it was a Sega arcade, it would be mostly Sega game. Like that, they would focus more on that, obviously. Right. Um, what year was that? Is that on there? Is it 79 or 80? I want to say that. Uh, Heavyweight Champ was 76. I'm I'm looking oh. at a different. Link. Oh wow, uh, yeah. 76. Okay, but I think but the arcade, I think the. Like, uh, Clip was from 79. Okay. So we're talking like right before arcades really start to blow up. Like Pac-Man's the next year. That's like the cutoff. It's like Pac-Man, you're, you're, you're off and running there. Okay, do a few more here. Hey, Pat and Ian. This is Don from Minneapolis. Big fan of the podcast. That's Don uh, on the phone. Pat, I've been a fan of you since I first saw you on AVGN. Thank you. And then I started watching your show. Ian, I've just been a fan uh, from the podcast based on your honesty, integrity, and love of food. Uh, like my question <laughs> is, if they made a Smash Brothers style fighting game based on human history, what contenders would you uh, want to be in there? I'll start you off with a few. Uh, Genghis Khan, Ernest Hemingway, Muhammad Ali, Will Smith, whose special move could be a bitch slap. Well, the, well, Will Smith played Muhammad Ali, so that's kind of weird. I uh, bring that up. Why are we getting all these like Bill and Ted questions this week? Uh, but I'm gonna go with Teddy Roosevelt again. But I will also say, why not? Let, let's throw Truman Capote in there. Uh, let's get Edgar Allan Poe in there. Let's get a couple novelists in there. We'll Talk with a pen or so, some literary characters come out. Yeah. Uh, can Ted, we? Teddy. Okay. Teddy has his his stick he carries, but he was a hunter. He has a rifle, or he just he can call on the his animal friends because he was the, the big first conservationist in our country to come and just attack you. Oh, uh, we should definitely get Vlad the, the Impaler in oh, there. Oh, well, Teddy had his bear too. Yeah. What's that? Vlad, the, get Impaler? Vlad the Impaler in there. That makes sense. Absolutely. Uh, Pancho Villa. Pancho Villa, okay. Pancho Villa, I'd like to see in there. Um, get some old old West. Get Billy the Kid. Get Billy the yeah, kid. get Billy the Kid in there. <laughs> <laughs> this is really Bill and Ted. Let's now. throw Mary Magdalene in. 
Mary Magdalene. Okay. So Mary Magdalene. In. All right. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's a fun choice, though. I could, I could think on that one for, a, for I could think on that question for a while. We don't want to go down the religious road. We can, we can get people after us. Um, yeah, that's that's a, that's a good one. But yeah, it's whether whether or not you go for more warriors versus like eating like one offs, like like Mark Twain. Probably Mark Twain would be fun. Mark Twain. He could summon a knight in King Arthur's court. There you go. You see where we're going. Oh, I do a couple or whatever it is a uh, Yankee in King a Yankee Arthur's, in court? King Arthur's yes. court. He did the movie, I think. Yep. This is David from Dallas. I've got a three-party here. Three? As a fan of fighting games, uh, when rating or reviewing them, I've always had to split them up in two categories, pre-Street Fighter 2 and post-Street Fighter 2. I was wondering if you felt the same and if there was any other genre where you felt the game came out that changed how you looked at uh, all preceding games in that genre. Lastly, are there any pre-Street Fighter 2 fighters that you recommend? I have always had fond memories of Yi R Kung Fu. Thanks. There's like three or four only pre Street Fighter uh, two. I mean, besides Street Fighter, Yi R Kung Fu uh, Warrior, which we talked yeah. about before in the podcast, the overhead uh, um, uh, uh, the vector graphics vector game. graphics game we talked about. I don't even count Punch Out or Super Punch Out because they're not. I mean, sure. Um, Soul Calibur with the first, not Soul Calibur, but, but and, Soul Blade and Karate Champ. Soul Blade, I think, uh, because I played it before Soul Calibur was kind of like my not my first introduction to uh, 3D fighting games, <clears throat> but it was um, it, it was the the combination of the weapons in the 3D arena uh, and, and how smooth and snappy the gameplay was. That was the one that made me realize fighting games weren't just something that I was going to enjoy on a two dimensional plane. Sure. They could easily make a good transition into 3D because I was really nervous about that for a while. When Tech it comes to video games, I've always kind of hated dealing with like changes in technology you know, like or Tekken 2 um, I I was not a huge Tekken player oh, I no. was no so soul soul oh. edge was my 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 okay. first big 3d fighting game that I played I remember Tekken me okay once Tekken, Tekken 2 was outstanding I was like wow this is this is something I played some of it for sure but oh, Tekken 2, I love Tekken 2 when it came out and then um, I, I can't remember what the first question was I'm sorry but in time when reviewing fighting games what was the question like do you separate things in your head is there like another game like where like you, you view it like pre post a certain game like pre Post and pre Street Fighter Two, like for a genre. Oh, um, I don't think I have another one. Uh, maybe I don't know. Uh, Running gun shooters, maybe with a like Contra, maybe <clears throat> something like that. I don't know. Uh, to me, I haven't quite like I, I don't have it like locked down, but I do have like in my head a, a, a it's kind of like a post post radius for shooters. Okay, and then uh, post I would say probably post Battle Garaga for um for Bullet Hell. Okay. It was like the first real like crazy bullet hell. But no, I mean, I'm sure there is, but nothing I can think of off the top of my head. Right. Oh, platformers. Okay, that's pre and post Mar Super Mario Brothers. Oh, there wasn't that many before that, but yeah, that's a there one. were, but they were sometimes single screen or very simple. I mean, it, it completely changed the game. Yeah, it's Smurf. Uh, some people could consider Jungle King slash Hunt a, a platformer. To me, it's more of an action game, but you are running to the side and going, so it's like... When did eh. Spike come out on Vectrex? Spike was not, 84, probably. That was Spike a platformer. It's a platformer. I mean, literally, all you do is jump from platform to platform. Darn it! Uh, up, only, 83. Well, you go up ladders. Yeah. You're a ladder, more of a ladder climber. That, that game's tough to play with the buttons. The four, the Vectrex button layout, they had to figure out to put two in, like, like Super Nintendo. The four across is rough. Uh, some of those games. That's a big, that's a big chunky controller there. Um, and then obviously you have platformers like like Pitfall, yeah, and things like that. If you want to count Pitfall, all right. Uh, you want to check in with someone? Here yeah, let's check in. All right, let's we'll check in with someone. Hey, Pat, saw your tweet. Yeah, happy anniversary to you too. Let's both celebrate. When I said you'd be the Coleco chameleon of YouTubers, and that you don't know anything before the NES. No lies detected. Seriously, what do you know before the NES? Huh? Where's your guidebook about the Vectrex? Where is it? Tons of classics on that system. You never talk about them, like Solar Quest and Web Wars and Rip Off. That one's my favorite. Yeah, <laughs> that game really inspired me. But the Atari, you don't know dick about the Atari. Like Combat, one of the best games ever. I've never heard you mention it once. But it's not like you know about modern stuff either. Let's be honest. The way you talk about NFTs, you sound like the grown-ups from the Apple Jacks commercials. <laughs> Why do they call it Apple Jacks if it doesn't taste like apples? You'll never understand, Mom. That's you, Pat. Your mom now. Go buy a minivan. And then right after you do, go drive it off a fucking cliff. <laughs> Oh, wait a second. Whoa. You're keeping that light and fluffy Whoa. there. Tommy, what's happening Tom, there? Tom, Tom. 
what's, what's happening there? Yeah, I, you know, the, the Twitterversary of that awful tweet, um, it was funny. It, it, it was funny. It was funny. It, a, lot, a lot of projection in that tweet. So much projection. So much projection in, in that. You know, he, he likes he likes to call people jealous, like, like calling Frank Cipaldi jealous gatekeeping. He likes to throw around jealous and gatekeeper and things like that. The one thing about Tommy, whenever we brought this up, it's like Tommy and I remember that I worked on video game years and, and, and had a hand in, in those episodes and featured the Intellivision and featured the Vectrex and other stuff. And it's just funny when you see stuff like that. And it's like, well, whatever. It is what it is. 